Nichts ist unmöglich, haben sie uns gesagt. Damals, als wir Kinder waren.
Nichts ist unmöglich. Nichts ist unmöglich, haben sie uns gesagt. Damals, als wir Kinder waren. Nichts ist unmöglich, haben sie uns gesagt. Damals, als wir Kinder waren. des Möglichen mehr und mehr verblassen. Folge deinem Traum. Nichts ist unmöglich.
Thank you.
What's up YouTube? So my name is Dash Glitch. I run my own YouTube channel. I mainly focus on uh, software synthesizers, uh, Cubase and production stuff in the software realm. However, for those who do know me and have been following my channel, you know that I'm a huge fan of modular synthesis and VCV Rack as well. And I've actually been following Omri's channel for quite a while. So I'm super stoked to be invited to one of these mycelium symposium events. 
So I've planned something pretty special today. Well, I think it's pretty special. I guess it's more of a conceptual thing. Super simple DIY project that I put together to help myself perform during uh, live performances. And it's also quite a cool little patch tool that I want to show you guys. And I kind of want to talk through the whole design process, the how the concept came to be and yeah, the final product. And I want to show you guys how useful it actually is in live context. So like I said, this is more of a conceptual thing. Um, so the system that I've built is actually a hardware unit. You can actually see it trilling over here, but you can replicate this very easily inside VCV rack using simple switches and stuff like that. So just for live performances, I think this type of concept could be helpful for you guys. So yeah, I figured I wanted to share it. And again, big thanks to Omri for inviting me to his channel to take part in this event. So yeah, let's dive in and have a look at what I call Signal Hill. So for those who are wondering uh, what the name means, where it comes from, I grew up in this beautiful city, Cape Town, South Africa. And well, not in the city, I kind of live in the suburbs just outside the picture. But for anybody who grew up in Cape Town, the Table Mountain, Lion's Head and Signal Hill are kind of like an iconic backdrop to growing up in the city. Signal Hill was actually historically used by maritime and Navy as a kind of contact point between ships coming into the bay um, so that they could cal calibrate their uh, stuff. I'm not a big boat person, so I don't know how it works, but it was the contact point to send signals to and from boats that were coming into the bay to let them know that they could dock and all sorts of stuff like that. So why is this important? The kind of system that I've designed was designed to send signals throughout my rack. So that's where I got the idea for Signal Hill because I designed it, I live in Cape Town and it's sending signals to different places in the rack. So anyway, enough blabbering, let's have a look at the actual Signal Hill. So this is the system. It's a super simple box, just made up of all passive components, uh, incorporating two dual switches and two single switches. So the power of something like this is, you know, in live contexts, you can switch between different, you know, triggers or audio signals. Um, because I've got the dual switches, you can actually do a nifty kind of bypass thing, which I'm going to show you guys a little bit later as well. Um, and then there's these single switches, which can be used to send modulations or audio signals to different outputs. Um, you can send one source to two places, or you can choose between two sources. So because of the fact that it's passive, it can kind of work both ways. There's no uh, voltage control, making sure that voltage is only going a specific way and stuff. It's, it's all passive and it's very easy to make, literally from components that you can buy at the hardware store. So the trick with getting this to work uh, in the most ideal way is to use switches that have this off in the middle position system. So what this means is when the switch is in the middle position, no signal gets sent through. When it's on the one side, signals from the one side get sent through and from the other side, vice versa. So because it's a dual switch, we're using one switch to switch between two paths, each with two sources. So in this system, how I've set it up is this is triggers for bass. And then this is the output for that. And then this is normal triggers for a kick. And then these are like a full, like rolls for the kick. And notice that there's nothing coming in on this side, but that's because when the kick is rolling, I want to mute the bass. I don't want any triggers to be sent with the bass. So you can kind of patch it in all sorts of different ways to create these different types of fills. But anyway, this is just a quick example of how useful it is in this type of, type of kind of live performance thing, specifically with dance music for creating these fills and rolls. So for anybody who's wondering, the regular triggers are coming from Euclidean circles and then the rolls are coming from the marbles the T side is basically set to the orange mode. So it's randomly generating these kind of grid-like patterns. So anyway, this is the result.
So like I said, you could use it as a kind of bypass switch as well. This is particularly handy for applying filter to your kick and bass, because say for example, you don't want a filter being applied throughout your whole performance. You just wanna apply a bit of filter during the breaks and stuff like that. So I wanna show you guys how to set up a system like this with a switch to bypass an audio signal or so you can switch a filter on and off something that might not be possible with a certain filter module that you have or something like that. So this module over here, the Dopefer, this is what's mixing my kick and bass signal together. So what I'm gonna wanna do is let's just audio out over here. We're gonna wanna melt the signal so we can send it to two sources. You don't need an active melt for this because it's not gonna simultaneously be playing to those two sources, it switches between them. So you can use a passive melt for this application. Um, so what we're going to want to do is, let's say, for example, let's run the dry signal into XB. And then let's run the duplicate of the dry signal into a filter. So I'm just going to go with this red dragon over, over here. It's a nice fat low pass filter with a distortion. So it's great for creating these kind of break type of things. Then what we're going to want to do is the filtered input we're going to want to send to Y over here. So here I've got the one path. So we could do, have done it over the C or the D. We don't necessarily have to do it there. We could use this to actually switch between different percussion things. So actually, I want to quickly just switch this over to the D over here so we can use this as the bypass switch. So let's just set this to DY and DX, which is here. So now this will be our filter and it doubles up as a mute switch for the actual audio. Okay, what other applications is this useful for? Say for example, we've got that filter, we can use the switch to choose from, say for example, two different modulation sources or no source in the middle. So let's wire this up to like an LFO, a random modulator, and then let's send the output to the, to the cutoff modulation of the filter. So here's another nifty thing where you can use these dual switches to switch between simultaneously switching triggers to a specific source, as well as the modulation to like a different source. So here, for example, I've got this Platts doing this weird percussive synthy thing. Um, and when I switch the B switch, what it's gonna do is it's gonna change the rhythm that it's being triggered by. You can't see Platts, it's off screen, by the way. Um, but it's also gonna change the modulation that's being sent to my mimeophone. So it's gonna cr create a weird pad out of the percussive stuff. Check this out.
let's talk about how you make it. So I'm not going to show you guys myself actually soldering the thing because that's taking too much time. I think once you just wrap the head around a few certain things conceptually, it's actually really, really easy to do. If you can solder or if you know somebody who can solder, uh, it, it took me like less than an hour to put this thing together. So the components that you're going to need are a mono jack. Um, I chose to go with this type of panel mount because I find they're nice and they made they're constructed by metal, so it's going to last a little bit longer than you know those kind of like plasticky ones like this. Um, this is not the exact one. I didn't get a Switchcraft. I got a kind of uh, generic one, but just this is the best picture I could find for you guys. Then with the switches, the dual switches, you're going to need a DPDT toggle switch on off on. So what this means is it's a dual pole. I think it's dual pole. Because it's on off on, it's got that mute in the middle. Another thing to kind of wrap your head around is these things work backwards. I'm gonna show you guys how I wired it up on the dual switch. Then I'm gonna show you guys how I wired each channel up for the single switch. And then I'm sure you guys can expand the idea uh, yourselves and create different variations. You don't have to go with the four different switches. You can create big things or just single things depending on your needs, you know. I find for my live performances, this was exactly what I needed. I actually made a few iterations of this type of thing, um, which I might talk about a little bit later on in the video. Um, but this is the kind of final product. I guess it kind of helps to test things out a few times before finishing up on something. Uh, anyway, so here, what we want to do is we want to wire up these jacks to these poles. And you'll notice that, so say for example here, I'm going to make uh, one channel. So let's go, uh, let's say for example, in this context, it's going to be our kick channel. So let me just duplicate this layer. Um, so this is the inputs of the normal trigger, the roll trigger, and then we're going to want an output. Okay, so we can say this is the outputs. So here, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want now to create our base triggers. So let's duplicate this layer. So first thing to wrap your head around is the ground switches or the ground poles on each jack. You want to wire those all to the same thing. So what I did is my box has like one big metal kind of ring that goes around the whole thing and all the jacks, the ground just connects directly to those. And that's, that's that kind of thing done. You don't have to worry about the ground again. If we have a look at this actual jack here, you'll see that there's two pieces of metal, which you can solder to. There's this one, which kind of connects to this ring here. And then there's this one, which is kind of in between this little sandwich of material. I'm not sure what that's made out of anyway. This one that's connected to this inner ring, this is your ground. So this is what connects to the sleeve of the jack connector. Uh, then this one is what connects to the ring. So what we're going to want to do is connect all of these to a common ground. So like I said, in my example, I've just got, you know, not just each switch, the entire circuit has one big common ground. So let's just say um, I've got this big metal connector coming in here and coming in here. So this goes onto all of the other switches. Uh, you don't actually have to connect ground to the switches themselves, I don't think. Maybe you do electronically, maybe it would sort out that little click that I have. Um, somebody maybe let me know who knows a little bit more about electronics, but I believe this is the correct way to do it. Um, so then, all of these ground connectors here, let's just connect directly to the common ground. Nice and simple. So how do we connect this to the actual switch? So the middle connectors of each of these poles or each of these channels will be the output. This one, let's go with the bottom channel. It doesn't actually matter as long as the same connectors are connected to the same poles of the switch you'll be good but it doesn't matter whether it's the top or the bottom because one switch is doing both tasks um, so here this is another confusing thing i'm not sure why this is like this but the poles at the bottom here the left and right terminals these are actually reversed so if we switch this switch to the left position it's actually going to draw the input from the right pole so I don't know why this is, it's a bit weird, but that's something I actually fucked up the first time, uh, the first few times I made switches. I had to re-solder them anyway. Um, I actually broke a couple of switches because you gotta be really quick with this. Because of this plastic, it melts really quickly. You gotta solder these little connectors really, really quickly. So buy a couple of spare switches if this is the first time you're working with these kind of little plastic switches. Um, just another thing to bear in mind. Anyway, so this right hand jack we want to connect to the left hand pole. So let's 
solder our green wire to that and then let's solder our blue wire to this one like this it's not a particularly neat circuit diagram but uh, you guys will understand uh, and it'll it'll work hopefully for you guys so let's connect our kick triggers remember the output is in the middle let's connect that there so again remember that these are reversed so this side and let's go with like pink this side we want to connect to this side right and then let's go with like light blue here this side we're going to connect to this one so remember it's reversed and that's as simple as that we've created one dual switch and this is going to switch between our kick channels and the roll and the bass channel and the muted bass this is, the single switch is actually a little bit simpler but for those who find this a little bit complicated let me show you how the single switch works single switches are called SPDT on off on connect all of these to the same common ground and then output to the middle so let's just choose a color let's go with like okay we've used this but it doesn't matter output to the middle boom done and then again remember to reverse those sides so this side the right hand side goes to the okay well the switch is actually upside down so this is even more confusing but <laughs> anyway <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry this is so confusing guys but you guys get the picture it will work hopefully uh, and i chose green as well anyway <clears throat> another thing that i kind of did is that, that is pretty funny like the actual interconnect cables that i used here i just took a lan cable cat5 or cat6 or whatever it is and just chopped a bit of that and inside it all the different poles of that all the different cables have color coded so it made it really easy to actually wire this together um, because everything, all the wires that I was using was color coded. So that's another little pro tip. I'm not sure if it's a pro tip, but anyway. So I want to talk about the different iterations of this of the design before I came up with this final design here. For those who may have been following my channel, you may have seen this in my live streams before. The I called it the Looney Tools. <laughs> For those who don't know, there's uh, another YouTube channel uh, called Synth DIY Guy, a guy called Kinkas who makes really cool videos about you know DIY synth stuff. Of course, he did a series called the Patch Pals, was about which was a bunch of like. Uh, passive things that were not specifically in modules but i took that idea and i built them into a module and i called it the looney tools because it was a bunch of random tools that i would use and i find myself using these selector switches so much for live performances and very rarely using any of the other tools in this component but i actually first created these like loose switches but the problem with that is i had to actually hold the switch and switch it and cables were coming loose and it was a whole fucking nightmare for live performance i mean it was okay for patching and stuff but for live performance it was a big no so i decided to build it into a module and one thing about this is that I was quite limited with space. So I didn't think things through quite intuitively in how I arranged the layout. Check this out. So I put the jacks and the switches right next to each other. So let's say, for example, we patch this 
row of switches together, you've got to kind of battle with cables to get to the switch, which is in between the jacks. And there's not enough space on this side to kind of fit my finger in to switch it again. So you kind of, it's, it's a fucking nightmare uh, in terms of the layout. I scrapped that idea. Um, I still used it for live performance when I really just needed a switch. And the problem though was it's such a waste of space in my rack. Um, for that, and I wanted to rethink the layout. So I went to the drawing board and created the final iteration, which is Signal Hill, this guy. As you can see, the big no's have been taken care of, which were space in between the switches so that you could get in there. They're really grippy, so you can kind of really, you know, mess around with them and get really in there during live performances, which is the thing. You need to get expressive, you know? Um, having that limitation of space within a Eurorack module size was quite limiting. Not only that is, for those who may have seen my performances before, like things just get a bit crazy with cables once I start patching. So having something outside of the rack is, was actually hugely beneficial because... Now I've got the space and the freedom, you know, I can just sit here almost like a kind of controller, hold this thing in my hands and switch the switches. And, oh, I really like this kind of, uh, this kind of interface, you know, it kind of reminds me of a joystick. And I'm thinking, you know, I could maybe expand this a little bit into something that even, you know, fits in the hand, but I'm, I'm actually really happy with this design. I think in terms of the intuitiveness and the usefulness, this is definitely the best iteration so far. So um, I'm going to call that the final one. But like I said, I still got to use it in a couple of um, uh, live performances to actually see uh, how, it, how it kind of all comes together. Because, you know, like I said, with this one, the only blaringly obvious kind of mistakes came about when I was actually using it in practice. And I think that's a very important thing about designing things is, you know, iterate and play with it. Um, and if it doesn't work, then change it. Awesome, that is about it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed my little journey into the design of this thing that I've created. And if you guys do end up creating your own, then send me pictures of it somehow, you know, tag me on Instagram or wherever it is that you are. Um, I'm gonna put links, or hopefully Omri is gonna put links for where you can find me in the description. Um, yeah, good luck on your journey creating these things to help perform with your synthesizers. And yeah, if you create patches that are inspired by this in VCV rack and all sorts of stuff, I'd also be very keen to see how you kind of put it all together. So anyway, big thanks to Omri for inviting me onto this channel for this event. I'm super stoked to be a part of it. Like I said, I've been following his channel for ages. I've been a big fan of what he's doing and VCV rack in general. And yeah, just modular synthesis in general. I love it. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed that. See you guys soon. Cheers.
this is Leonardo from Wult, and in this video I'm going to show you a quick overview of a project that you may have already seen before and it's the BCD drums which are a collaboration between BCD and me, a Wult, where I developed all the DSP well, BCD developed all the user interface and, and, and the code regarding that so I only develop the models and if you have been following my Facebook page you may have seen that during the 2020 I was publishing small snippets of what I was doing without trying to reveal too much so these are some of the posts that I made related to, to the drums that I was making but I never I tried to never confirm or deny what, what I was working on and the main idea with this with this project it was that uh, basically I had uh, like a complete freedom of developing whatever kind of top machine I wanted and Andrew was going to uh, develop the graphical user interface on top of that My idea was to develop this uh, collection of analog drums using low-tech electronics and you may ask why and that's because nowadays you can find any drum sound as a sample and what I wanted to, to do it was something like more in the styles of the, of the uh, vintage drum machines like the Roland which is one of the ones that I use as, as reference so it will be like a drum machine that Bull would have developed in the 80s even when in the 80s I was just born and at the same time I was trying to get all the constraints that I would have had when developing uh, a drum machine back then so the drums will go, will going to be mostly analog and, and if I needed digital parts they needed to be uh, with a limited memory because back then uh, having a, a few kilobytes of memory was kind of expensive so I, I was trying to use very little memory like less than 32 kilobytes so it would be basically uh, like this homemade drum machine made from the 80s and then suffering this process of fortification and now I'm going bringing it back uh, to this time as an advanced drum machine for the 21st century and now let's let's take a look at the models and these are the VCV drum modules as you can see there are two versions uh, one that is contains the full drum machine and everything is routed uh, to, to a final mix but you can find uh, each voice as a separate module as you can see here, we have uh, a kick, a snare, tom, clap, and rim shot. And all these are analog models that I developed. And the, all the symbols, like the close hat, the open hat, the right, and the crash, are, uh, like, are, are not analog models. They are more or less inspired by the way the 909 uh, symbols work. But it's important to, to note that I did not use any of the original uh, sounds. So for this, I, I created a, a special synthesis engine that, as I mentioned before, uh, the objective is, was that it needed to be very, very memory efficient. So that way I was constrained and, and I had to come up with an idea on how to, how to synthesize these sounds. Uh, uh, sticking to that limit otherwise I could just uh, play a sample but that's not the case this is a very small uh, uh, synthesis engine so for now I'm going to uh, to use only the only this version and let's let's start with the kick drum And I have connected the Exaquark because it gives me uh, a sequencer with 16 tracks, with six tracks, sorry, that I can use. And this is the output of the of the uh, trigger. 
but as you can see I'm also using the, the color output uh, in the dynamic range uh, all to the left so I can get a signal that is positive and negative depending on the color and I'm using that one to, to do the accents so if, if I don't have any accent it will sound like this and if I start adding the accent and yeah you can you should be able to feel in the difference so all the modules have like these four parameters and they have uh, similar inputs to control each of the parameters you have a trigger that you can also uh, press manually and all the all the modules have the the accent input that you can control so for the kick it is mainly a model after the 909 uh, but you can also have the the 8 model which is more or less the 808 and let's randomize it to see what kind of sounds it can produce It's, the sound is super low that I cannot even hear it in my tiny uh, headphones but if you are listening to this video in proper speakers you, you should be able to hear in the, the sound I'm going back to the 9 model yeah, and basically you can control the, the sweep which is I'm going to put it to the center and then the, the attack uh, is, is not an envelope attack but is, is how, how hard it hits so there is softer and there is a stronger hit and, and other models have the, have the same the same feature and of course you can control the decay uh, let me mute this one and let's go to the snare in the snare it, it's it's as well uh, more or less based on the 909 and then you can control the tune uh, the level of, of the noise And also how hard is is the the hit or the or the snap and the decay of course. Let's randomize to so listen to some of the sounds that we can get. And I have to mention that all all these parameters that we are tweaking, we are actually changing the the analog circuit that was uh, on the, on under it so i try to to capture some of some of the tricks that you will have with a real circuit and that's the snare let's go to the next one which is a tom for the tom we have we have three different types low uh, the mid and the high going to the low and this this the tom is one of the of the modules that i made more tweaks because i actually don't like the the 909 toms so i try to to make them to, to, to make a module uh, the way i i, I want it and I wanted to, wanted it to sound let me change to the high from the kick so it sounds a little bit better Now 
let's go to the clap. The clap is an analog model as well. And this velocity is more or less intensity. And this space, uh, it produces this kind of noise that makes it uh, sound like a like kind of a river. But it's, it is not a river, it's, it's just the, the way the, the noise is, is mixed. Of course you have the, the decay and the tone. Shot. And this one is, is one of the models that I also tweaked a lot and it's improved because the actual rim shot in the, in the 909 is very simple. You get just a sound like this. Something like that. Uh, but in my version uh, you can of course tune it. sound a little bit more interesting then this velocity is, is also like strength which is uh, heat and then in the tag we have uh, different ways of exciting the, 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 the physical model which in, in this case is just a, an analog circuit Side, we are exciting it with a, with a different signal, it makes it sound like this. Let's go to the next, which is a close hat. And as I mentioned before, this is a custom, super uh, optimized uh, synthesis engine for, for for the hats, for all the for all the symbols. And what we have is, of course, you can tune it. And then you have like different kinds of of metal, which on this side is like a more airy uh, sound and then we also have the the tag which controls the, the strength of the hit let me randomize it so you can hear it And 
lastly, let's uh, take a listen to the crash. But I don't have space in the mixer, so I'm going just to disconnect the right and listen to the crash. Same features, decay, attack, etc. And yeah, let's try to make it more interesting. And I have, I'm going to enable all of the drums. short video and, and give it a try to, to the these drum models. Uh, I, I'm very happy with them and I hope that you like them as well.
This is Manu from Befaco in Barcelona. First of all, thank you very much for being here, listening, watching us. Thank you very much, Omri, for inviting us to this symposium and, and be part of this. And thank you very much to everyone for 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 using Befaco modules in BCB Rack. It's it's a great great uh, opportunity, and we we are very happy that you all are enjoying them. Uh, so yeah, Befaco has been around for a while now, and and Befaco, it's, it's, it's been in BCB Rack since day one. We cannot be more thankful for Andrew for approaching us at the very beginning uh, to use our models in BCB. Uh, we were not aware how big this go was going to be. We were very happy with BCB. We really loved the, the project since the beginning. But right now, the BCB, the BCB quality, uh, the community, the size of the community, the number of models out there, it's just outstanding so we cannot be more thankful to be here um, we are very lucky to be able to say that uh, uh, more befaco modules are being ported now to bcb rack last month we had four modules uh, uh, new modules released to the plugin they are available now and more modules are uh, uh, are being developed as we speak. In fact, today we uh, we are going to be showing you some new ones and giving you some insight of, of the process. We will get there. Uh, also, uh, we are glad to announce that from now we are going to start uh, releasing uh, new modules, new Befaco modules in BCB Rack at day one or even a little bit 
earlier. So uh, BCB community is going to be able to to try and, and use the modules at the same time as the modules are released. Always, if it's possible, there are some modules that will not make sense to be ported to BCB, but the intention is that the, the core of the modules that are released in, in, in physical will be um, will be released in BCB Rack as well. All this uh, can be possible only thanks to one person that I'm going to introduce you now, uh, and I'm going to leave you with him. Uh, this person is Iwan Hemingway. Uh, he is uh, part of, uh, of the community, of the BCB Rack community, and he approached us uh, because he the, develop uh, a port of the per call our model so he came to us hey look i did this and it was just outstanding and so he offered to to be porting more models and we cannot be more thankful so yeah thank you very much also to him uh, again i cannot express how lucky we are to to be here so well uh, i'm gonna leave you now with uh, with him um he's gonna be presenting the new models he's working in He's going to be presenting the new module that it's going to be releasing uh, in in BCB at the same time as, as in physical. It's a module that will be presented in Superboot or has been presented in Superboot. This is record before Superboot. So, well, you know. Anyway, so uh, again, thank you very much for listening, for being there. I leave you with uh, Iwan Hemingway. Iwan, it's all yours. Thank you, Manu. Yeah, it's been super fun collaborating with you guys to bring these modules to BCB Rack. And yeah, as you say, hopefully there's many more still to come. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there's quite a collection of modules building up now. Uh, I should say that none of this is possible without the hard work of Andrew, both on the early set of Bifaco modules, some of which you can see here, um, but also in BCB in general. It's a super nice platform to develop for. Uh, yeah, it makes it really easy to get up and running. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd start off by taking a little look behind the scenes of the development process with one of the recent modules, uh, Chopping Kinky. And Chopping Kinky is uh, a two-channel wave folder. And what it does is it take, if you feed in a signal such as a, a sine wave, um, it's going to increasingly m modify the gain of that um, and then eventually fold the wave back in itself. So let's have a little look and listen as well to what that's doing. So blue is the original sine wave that we're feeding in, and here we're going to increase the gain. And you can hear, um, yep, you can see the wave folding back in itself, you get all those extra harmonics coming along, and you get this really harmonically rich sound. So the question is then, how do you go about capturing that in software? So the wave folder has this nice property that for each voltage you put in, it responds with a unique voltage out. So if I was to uh, just plug in this using the attenuator, a constant voltage, what we can do is increase the voltage and, uh, sorry, I'll start that again. Increase the voltage and measure out the response over time. Uh, and yeah, it's a little hard to do that actually, as you can see with the offset knob. So instead, what I tend to do is feed in a ramp. So just to look at what that would look like. What that's doing is uh, probing the device uh, with all the possible voltages, and the pink trace is showing the, the response. Um, and so that's that's exactly what I did with the, the actual hardware version. As you can see here um, on the oscilloscope, this is the trace from the hardware. And you can then uh, capture that data and yeah, plot it basically. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, you can then fit it to all sorts of fancy equations, signs and exponentials and this sort of thing. Um, and so yeah, the colored lines there are the, the sort of approximation to it. And you can see that wave shaper A has this sort of symmetric response where input voltage on the x-axis and output voltage on the, the y-axis. Um, and then wave shaper B, the, the one at the bottom of the device, is not symmetric. So you get different responses to positive and, and negative voltage. Um, so this is made possible by using the Expert Sleepers ES8 module. And this lets you get CV in and out from hardware to VCV rack uh, and vice versa. And so it makes it very easy to record what you're doing, basically, uh, and analyze things. Um, 
so yeah, that's the process for chopping Kinky, but it's the same for a lot of the other modules. So um, here's an example, Morph Fader, that's one of the new modules that's coming out um, at the end of this month. And here what I'm doing is, in the, the GIF you can see, I'm trying to modify uh, this crossfader. So you said Morph Fader is a four-channel CV-controlled crossfader. And I'm trying to modify that in VCV rack and at the same time in hardware. It's a little hard to keep them in sync. <laughs> But um, yeah, and the two traces here are showing that they're broadly doing the same thing. Um, and yeah, that's the sort of process I use to make sure that the, the hardware equivalents are, are doing exactly what the, 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 soft, the software is doing. So speaking of new modules, um, I now want to take a little look at one of my favorites from the new collection, and that is Mug Slicer. So yeah, Mug Slicer, uh, it looks quite complicated on the face of it, but it's broken down into some simple sections. Um, the first, the, the top part here is this gate sequencer. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is provide a clock, so just a square wave from the, the LFO here, and you can feed that to clock in. It, it does run on its own, but it works best when you, you, in this context, where you clock it. And then um, by dragging this play switch up, we can start off the sequence. Um, and you can see that it's uh, ticking along there. And these outputs here give the, the gates at each step. So we can plug in a kick drum just to have a, a listen. Uh, get rid of this. Yeah, so that's just in the first step. But this output here gives you the gates summed across all the steps. So the next thing you might want to do is, uh, is look at this gate mode here. So that controls how many gates are output per step. So currently it's just one gate per step, but you can increase that to all the way up to eight gates per step. And um, you can also restrict this to this quadratic only mode. And so that lets you just have one, two, four or eight, which might be a little bit more musical depending on your what you're wanting to use this for. Um, and then uh, the, there's also the, the clock out. Uh, and so that's basically, that basically lets you um, use a, a divided and multiplied signal. So we're gonna use that to patch up some a very basic hi-hat. So let's just uh, grab some a noise module here. We'll feed some noise into Percol. Percol is just a four channel um, envelope generator. Uh, and we're gonna trigger that with the clock out. And put that back into the mix. And we're just getting a very simple hi-hat. Um, so yeah, we can modify from the context menu um, the clock out. So maybe we want to make that a little bit more rapid. Um, so that's the, the, the base sequence there. Other things you might want to do, well, you can use this knob here to uh, um, speed up or multiply or divide the main clock speed. So, so now we're going half as fast or twice as fast, all the way up to very fast. Um, so yeah, you can use that to uh, get divisions of the, the input clock. Um, the last, this is probably a good point to mention that, um, or introduce the one of the new modules that actually is going to be released simultaneously on hardware and software, and that's this MEX, and that's an expander for Mux Slicer. So if it's uh, adjacent, or to, sorry, to the right of Mux Slicer, then it uh, syncs up and you can see it's eight steps in the same way as that we have there. Um, and, and what it does is if the switch here is to the left, then it's going to use um, either whatever is present here or uh, the clock out. And so you can see the the LED that it's using the clock out division there. If it's in the middle, the step is muted and no gates are output. And if it's on the right, then uh, it's going to give the output of all gates effectively or whatever that step is. Um, so let's just go ahead, right click, randomize that. We'll get a nice little sequence and we can use that to trigger the kick instead. So straight away we're getting some more interesting patterns there. Um, we can make multiple copies of this, so we can maybe instead for the hi-hat also do 
this and randomize. So yeah, you can build up uh, increasingly complex variations of that, that core melody. Um, so that's just the top half. Uh, we've not really looked at the sequential switch part of it. So let's go and uh, make another copy of the mux slicer here. I'm going to clock it um, and start it off. Um, and now what we're going to do is use this to uh, control the pitch sequence of an even VCO. And I should say that the, the switch operates in two modes, either um, uh, 8 to 1 or 1 to 8. You can select that from the context menu. So depending on what you want to do. So we're going to stick to um, uh, the mode where it's eight inputs and one output. And we're going to use this all in input here. So what that does is whatever voltage or signal is present there, it will copy it to all of the steps. So let's just put in a one volt signal. And we're also going to go ahead and change the sliders, just get a little bit of a pattern going here. Um, and now what's going to happen is this is going to get copied to all of these steps, um, but it's going to be scaled by the where the value of these sliders. So you're going to get one volt here, maybe lower here, and so on. Um, we're also going to quantize that just so we get something a bit more melodic, uh, and then listen to the results. So we can yeah patch up a little pitch sequence. Um, in fact, I've put in a voltage here, but we cannot. There is a normal voltage which is present if nothing's plugged in, so we can actually just set that to one volt, and we don't need to use this anymore. Um, and maybe we can make the sequence run a bit faster. So that's one use of the switch. Um, let's do use another mug slicer to try and select different parts of the waveform. So we can plug the even VCO into the all-in, so every step has that. Um, but then let's plug in some of the other waveforms to get them active on just those steps. Um, I'm going to clock this again and start off the sequencer and take a listen. Maybe we'll speed that up. And here, the sliders are just going to set the relative gains of those inputs. Um, so yeah, we're starting to get a nice little pattern going there. Um, and yeah, so th that's most of what I wanted to cover. A few things I didn't have, t didn't have time to mention. So one is um, you can set the, the step. So rather than scanning through, you can say just, just run to one specific step. Um, there's also, uh, if you drag the switch down, you get one-shot mode, um, and so that's just for if you want to play once through and then stop, you can do that. Um, and yeah, you might want to use it, as I said, in the opposite mode, so that's where it's uh, one input to eight outputs. And so you might have a pitch sequence that you want to direct to different VCOs, or a trigger sequence that you want to split off to different places uh, at different points in time. So yeah, um, lots of uses for the sequentials, which far too many to cover in a sort in a short session. So yeah, I think that's all I have time to cover just now. But um, so I think I'll hand back to Manu um, and yeah, go check out Mux Slicer and the new modules. They should be with us uh, at the end of the month. Okay, thank you, Iwan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, I, I think this is this is all for today. Um, uh, yeah, we have our announcement. Uh, Iwan have shown you what's coming. Uh, they will be available soon, hopefully. Um, and yeah, he will he will uh, be porting more things, more surprises. We have more models coming from the Befaco side, and 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 we are trying to see which ones are, are going to be the next ones. Uh, we really hope that you enjoy the, uh, the the models. We really 
hope that you keep on enjoying BCB. Uh, we really hope that you keep on making music. Uh, again, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Omri. Thank you, Andrew. And, and yeah, thank you all. Ciao.